Okay, so uh, questions 24 to 26, and uh, describes a pedigree for deaf mutism. It says, as is usual, okay, so that would be uh, Acer's code word to say that they expect that you've seen pedigrees before and that you know the basics of uh, Mendelian uh, genetics. And so uh, the uh, male is square, well, that's great, and the female circle. And so they talk about the shading. Okay, so and then you see down the, the right side of the pedigree, uh, one, Roman numeral 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, actually, Roman numeral 2 would be called the first filial or F1 uh, generation um, because uh, that's the generation after the first parents. And, um, and also, <clears throat> one of the things that you notice right from the outset is from the line of Roman numeral 1, when you look at the uh, couple 1 and 2, you notice that half their children have the disease and half their children do not. And you notice that those that have the disease are both male and female. So this tells you that this is a, an autosomal recessive condition. It's not X-linked uh, because, you know, in an X-linked uh, condition, you know, you would see that, uh, that the, uh, the sons would tend to have the disease that uh, uh, coming from the mother. And, um, uh, you know, if it's recessive from the mother. And uh, then you also see Roman, Roman numeral 1, uh, 3, and 4 all uh, have the disease. So that's, and then all their children have the disease. So that's very common uh, if it's a recessive condition. And, and this is also seen in, in Roman numeral 2 with parents 1 and 2. So that's uh, consistent with that from the previous generation. And then when you look at uh, Roman numeral and also Roman numeral 2, numbers 10 and 11, is also consistent with the previous generation. But then when you get to Roman numeral 3, and you look at the parents 8 and 9, and you see that they both have the disease, but none of their children have the disease, that should make you uh, question, okay, so what's really going on here if it's just an autosomal recessive condition? And then what should go through your mind at that point is if it is autosomal recessive, if the parents both have it and none of their children have it, then that suggests that it's at two different locations on uh, uh, the chromosome or two different chromosomes that are sorting independently. And, uh, and so uh, that would give you a condition in which uh, parent 8 would have autosomal um, homozygous recessive for one of the genes, but homozygous dominant for the other uh, gene, and nine would be the reverse. And so by doing that, they would both have the disease, and then all their children will be carriers, but none of them will express the disease. So these are just some things uh, to come to your mind. And then the uh, table starts to confirm that by showing that, um, you know, uh, in the second line of the table, you see capital D's and E's. Uh, would be normal, but anytime you have a s small d or small e together, then you have um, homozygous recessive for the allele and therefore deaf mute. So whether it be uh, that it's dd, small d, small d, or small e, small e, either way, you have homoz they are homozygous for the recessive allele and therefore um, they will be uh, deaf mute. And this is what is suggested uh, by the table. So now we look at the questions. So having that as a background, we take a look at the questions and the first one, uh, 24, a line that is missing from the table. So we look at the first one, capital D, small e, small e. Well, as just has been established, this is homozygous recessive and this will produce uh, deaf uh, mute. So knowing that antichoice A is incorrect because that would produce deaf mute even though <laughs> technically speaking uh, antichoice A is missing from the table <laughs> but uh, we know what Acer really meant by the question. So antichoice B, <clears throat> small d, uh, small e, of course uh, that is deaf mute. It's consistent with this. Whether it be only the DD or only the EE, either way uh, would have produced uh, deaf mute. 
but uh, having both, of course, would be. And that line is truly missing from the table, so that uh, answer choice B is the correct answer. Answer choice C shows um, uh, a condition which is indeed normal, uh, you know, because D, capital D is dominant. It doesn't matter the order if you put capital D in front or, uh, uh, you know, obviously this is equal to this, <laughs> just to make that very clear. So uh, answer choice C is actually in the table. You can find it on the second uh, line of the table. So, um, so it is there. And then um, answer choice D is, would actually be normal because it does not have either of these conditions so it would be normal and that is also uh, in the table and that's on the third line of the table so that's question 24 and the answer is b 25 uh, the deaf mute uh, phenotype occurs okay well we know that the deaf mute phenotype occurs whenever you are homozygous for the recessive allele if you're homozygous for the recessive allele, you have deaf mute, and that's very clear. So any other condition would not be true. So answer choice A says only two dominant alleles occur. But uh, two dominant alleles uh, would occur if we had this, capital D, small d, capital E, small e. So here we have two dominant alleles, and yet this would be normal. We know it's normal because it's on the second to last line of the table. We know it's normal because it makes sense because it's, these are dominant over the recessive uh, uh, alleles. So um, A is incorrect by saying only two dominant alleles occur because two occur here and yet it's not a deaf mute phenotype. Answer choice B says more than one recessive allele occurs. Well, we have more than one recessive allele. We have two, and yet this is normal. We have confirmed that. And answer choice C, one recessive allele of each gene occurs. We have one recessive allele of each gene, and yet it is not deaf mute. And answer choice D says, both recessive alleles of one of the genes occur. And indeed, we have both uh, recessive alleles of either of those genes would create a uh, deaf mute. So answer choice D would be correct. And then the last question in the series, question 26, which of the following gives the most likely genotypes of um, three Roman numeral three, eight, and nine? So of course we, we already discussed that, that one of them would have to be homozygous, recessive, for one of the genes and the other would have to be homozygous recessive for the other gene and they would have to be um, um, and, and that would make it possible for them to have the disease themselves but then not um, have any children with which have the disease so uh, when we look at the situation uh, question 26 we look at the possible answer choices answer choice a says both of them <laughs> Are, uh, are, well, basically this, which is normal. We know it's normal. We've established that in the previous question and from the table. So, but we know both of them actually have the disease. So neither of those parents, neither eight nor nine, can be uh, normal. So 26A is incorrect. 26B, uh, both have um, D, D, E, E, but we know that's to be impossible. It would make sure that both have the disease. But if both had small d, small d, if both had small d, small d, then all of their children would have the disease. Don't forget, these are sort independently. So we can take a look at this uh, Punnett square, and then you would see that 100% of the children would be d, 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 small d, small d. And that means they would all have the disease, so that's not possible. So then uh, another possibility is that, uh, as we described before, that one of the parents has uh, homozygous recessive uh, for one gene, but homozygous dominant for the other, and the other parent is homozygous uh, recessive for the other uh, a gene and homozygous dominant as well. So that would be 26C, and that would produce 
all offspring that would be heterozygous uh, for the genes. So they would be unaffected, but they will all be carriers of, of the disease. Um, so they would all be heterozygous. So that would be answer choice C. And then answer choice D is an option. Uh, again, the problem is, is that he, in answer choice D, you have the homozygous recessive condition, you have the heterozygous uh, condition, and that means that um, some of these children will end up having the disease, as you can see here. So some of these children would have the disease because they would be small e, small e. And, um, and that's not uh, permitted. Well, at least it's not permitted from the, uh, from the uh, pedigree that we're provided with. Okay, so um, in a real exam, of course, you know, you don't really have to do these Punnett squares, any of them, because I think the, uh, the question is, is quite clear as written. But uh, I was just writing this out so that, uh, you know, for those of you who may not have had a, as much experience. And if you have to read uh, more about this, you can uh, read about it in the, uh, in the uh, gold standard text. Um, there's Mendelian genetics here and, and here in 15.3. And in fact, in 15.3, it also shows a, a dihybrid um, cross with random mating. And uh, dihybrid is like the situation that we just looked at with uh, two different genes um, and uh, with random mating, however, sometimes the, it gets a little bit more complicated than what we did.